My name is Sandra Harding. Uh, I recently retired uh, in a year ago from UCLA where I have for 20 years been in the Graduate Department of Education with a joint appointment in Women's Studies. I got my doctorate in philosophy at UCLA in 1973 and before I came to UCLA I taught for 20 years at the University of Delaware. So what drew me to feminist theory in the first place? Well, I, when I started back to graduate school in 1968, uh, I, I went to graduate school late. I had been out for 12 years working in New York City. Um, when I returned to graduate school, the, very shortly after that, the women's movement started up. And um, my friends, graduate student friends, who were working in ethics and in political philosophy, were busy writing away about women's rights and abortion rights and a, di a different understanding of democracy and uh, uh, women's uh, uh, need to be in uh, important positions in the government. What was this, somebody thinking epistemology and philosophy of science supposed to do? We, those of us who worked in science and uh, knowledge epistemology areas, uh, were really quite puzzled how to, how to use the terrific energy and resources the women's movement was providing to think philosophy in a different way. Uh, what happened was that in the social sciences and some areas of uh, natural sciences, especially in biology with women's health issues and environmental issues, questions about the objectivity, about the, uh, the standard notion of objectivity as requiring value neutrality, came under fire, right? How could it be that these supposedly value neutral sociologies, uh, medical theories, and so forth, that clearly were directed by the needs and interests of pharmaceutical companies, of physicians as opposed to their patients, uh, of the welfare department instead of the people who were receiving welfare, of the World Bank instead of the people who needed uh, the resources for development. How could it be that this was value neutral? It clearly wasn't. And so uh, we started putting together, um, talking to people, in the other disciplines that had these epistemological and philosophy of science concerns. So um, in my case, we would put together panels at uh, AAAS or American Philosophical Association or the American Political Science Association, and we'd have on the panel would be me from philosophy and Nancy Hartsock from political theory and Ruth Hubbard from biology and somebody else from sociology, and we do parallel play. If any of you have had a two-year-old or been near a two-year-old, you know what I mean by parallel play. The two little kids sit in the sandbox, and they look at each other, and they play completely separately. One builds a sandcastle, the other builds a sandcastle. They look at each other, it's parallel play. And that's what we did on the platform at these conferences. We each talk about the lack of objectivity, of the presence of uh, all kinds of um, white elite male uh, class and race values that were shaping what counted as research, what counted as good research. Uh, and we slowly began to develop a series of questions about the natural sciences and the social sciences that took on the conceptual apparatus of those fields. As the sociologist of knowledge, Dorothy Smith, put the point, in modern bureaucratic societies like ours, ruling is largely, is often largely a matter of manipulating concepts, right? What counts as a citizen, right? What, how should we conceptualize a citizen? Right? How should we conceptualize a legitimate resident of the, this country? Right? How should we conceptualize 
uh, women's rights to control our own bodies, uh, and so forth. How do I define feminism? Well, I think of it, I think of feminism in the plural, feminisms. There are different feminisms for different groups of women and men in different places in history and around the world. Uh, what, they're very different from each other, but what they share is a concern to provide resources so that women, to, for women, uh, to be able to take greater control of our lives. So what is this article about? Um, well, first of all, I have to note an odd thing about standpoint theory. And that is that it has remained extremely controversial. People object to it all the time on all kinds of grounds. And this is, nevertheless, it's now 40 years old. <laughs> it's been a, this supposedly uh, inadequate theory. Um, has persisted for four decades. That tells you that there's something going on here that needs a little more thought. Let me point out first that standpoint theory is, uh, is thought of in a number of different ways. It's thought of as an epistemology, that is a theory of who, who can produce reliable knowledge and how knowledge should be justified. It's thought of as a philosophy of science, of how to, uh, what uh, best practices uh, and goals for scientific research should be. It's thought of as a sociology of science that uh, looks at the particular social conditions that create different kinds of uh, knowledge and so forth. So it, it has, and it's thought of as a methodology, of course, of uh, how to go about doing research. Standpoint theory is usually thought of as having a very particular historical lineage, and it does. Uh, Marx asked the question, what can we learn about uh, how the class system works by starting off from workers' lives, rather than starting off from the lives of the elites of the day. And a um, hundred and something years later, feminists picked this up and transformed it. Uh, it, uh, it, it does have a, a, a source in 19th century and earlier um, European philosophy, um, but the feminist standpoint was specifically developed, as I indicated earlier, as a result of the research being done out of the politics of the women's movement, right, by sociologists, political scientists, and so forth. However, so that's the official intellectual lineage of standpoint theory. But standpoint approaches appear to be organic in this sense. You, you can, every time a new group steps on the stage of history, it tends to say something like, gee whiz, from the perspective of our lives, things look different. So you can see the civil rights movement saying that. You can see the poor people's movements. You can see post-colonial and decolonial movements saying that, lesbian, gay, bi, trans. So standpoint methodology and, and theory is a kind of organic logic of research, I would say. In the article, I talk about three places, three sites of controversy in standpoint theory. Uh, the first one is that it extends uh, the um, logic of scientific research, the control of the scientific research process, back, one could say, to the beginning of the research process, that is, the context of discovery. And for philosophers, and indeed many scientists, most scientists perhaps, um, the context of discovery was supposed to be left free of all kinds of regulatory controls. There's lots of uh, talk in philosophy of science and in science of the, uh, these, uh, the serendipitous accidental 
uh, discoveries that were made, the, uh, who, who knew they were going to ask this question, the great insights, completely inexplicable, uh, of brilliant scientists. Um, as uh, Hilary Rose and Stephen Rose put the point, this way of doing philosophy of science makes science a humanity. It turns science into the kind of enterprise that uh, is conducted by great artists and great poets and great musicians. They get insights from who knows where and go on. It's their individual creativity, their connection with the universe in some mystical, inexplicable way that permits the production of uh, important new knowledge. Now there certainly is something right about that, but in fact um, the, or, the origins of scientific questions has another very clear dimension, namely whatever the funders and sponsors want funded and sponsored gets turned into scientific questions and the kinds of quest research questions that women or racial minorities or uh, poor people might want asked do not get asked. For example, how there's a whole field of neglected tropical diseases, right, which are uh, ones that don't interest. They don't strike rich people, they strike poor people living in jungles and so forth, so uh, why bother to figure out how to, how to resolve them? Um, and there's many other questions, of course, that all of these new social justice movements of the 1960s raised um, that had not gotten to the beginning of the official research process. So standpoint theory says that who gets to decide what counts as a scientific question is a very important part of the uh, research process and we social justice movement people want different questions asked than those that have been asked only by pharmaceutical companies, by militaries, by uh, national governments you're trying to control their population, their prisons, and, and so forth. So that's one site of controversy. And it should be, I'm arguing, controversial. It, we need to talk about how come science is directed and managed only, or primarily, by corporations, states, and militaries? That, that's a, an important question. What, it, what should be, the, is that what the relationship between science and society should be? Is everything we want to know going to be produced by sciences that respond only to the concerns of those groups? So that's the first side of controversiality that I think is important. Now, a second source of controversy for standpoint theory is that it seems to be making the knowers, not individuals primarily, but social groups. And that goes against our whole enlightenment of 500 year, or however you want to date it, 400, 300 year tradition of modernity. It's individuals who are agents of knowledge and of, of political action. And yet standpoint theory seems to be saying it's groups of people. It's women, it's poor people, it's uh, Latinas, it's uh, disabled people. These groups of people are the subjects or agents of knowledge. Um, and so that should be controversial. Um, and um, uh, there should be, you know, good defenses of both sides of that question. But certainly, I'm interested to defend the counter, uh, counter dominant view that, in fact, what people do both enables and limits what they can know. Um, we all have maps of our cities, uh, but if you travel the city. Uh, on a motorcycle or a car or go through it on a train or fly over it or walk it or bike it or push a baby carriage or uh, a walker uh, around it, you'll have a very different map of the city in each case. You'll know different things about how to get from here to there uh, according to how you are able to interact 
with your environment as you travel. Uh, so these different, the fact that um, different groups gain different kinds of knowledge, of course each person's knowledge is individual, is individual. Each of us individually knows things that other, nobody else knows. Yet we share certain kinds of experiences because of the kinds of obligations and duties and opportunities created in our lives. Not everybody takes care of small children, the elderly and the sick. People who do that will have certain kinds of knowledge, not only of small children, the elderly and the sick, but of the dominant social institutions that are supposed to be providing resources or not uh, for those groups. Uh, so the second point of controversiality here is to understand that knowledge is always a social product as well as an uh, something produced by particular individuals. They're, all, they're always located at, in certain historical moments, certain geographical places, certain cultures, and certain ways in which those cultures and geographies and histories interact. So knowledge is both individually produced and produced through group experiences. So the third uh, source of controversiality I want to talk about, there are others, uh, but the third one I wanted that the article talks about um, is the, the fact that it's, standpoint theory seems to be doing social constructivism. That is, it's arguing that knowledge is socially constructed. But standpoint theory has a, has a different kind of constructivism. Uh, as I indicated, it argues that uh, what, how we interact with natural and social environments both enables and limits what we can know. It doesn't determine what we can know, uh, and nevertheless it's relevant to what we can know. It, it provides certain opportunities for us to think in kinds of ways we might not have otherwise thought. So what do I want uh, readers to take away from this article, the most important point? Um, I think it's that we should always ask who Whose knowledge is being produced? For whom is a particular re piece of research going to provide benefits? And who's going to bear the costs of that being the question pursued rather than others that might be important? Do I want to give advice to young people today? No way! I have no idea what the world you're living in now, let alone the one you're going to be living in, is about, and you will find your own ways to ask the kinds of questions that are important for you to ask. Go for it.